Hello, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Night Sky Podcast. My name is Billy Newman. And I'm Marina Hansen. I want to say thanks to everybody who's uh, tuning in once again to listen to us talk a little bit about the events that are going to be happening in the night sky above us for uh, the second, or excuse me, the third and fourth week of July in 2016. There's a few things that are going on this week, uh, which would be cool to talk about. And then a few other things that are going to happen or going to happen in uh, like the next three weeks or so. I think those will be fun to talk about too. Yeah, we've got some cool stuff coming up. It will be cool. Yeah. So um, I guess talking about a little bit of the news stuff or some of the uh, sky watching events that are going to be happening this week. Uh, a few things to keep in mind, right, is that uh, we just had our full moon the other night. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I think that was like the 19th, right? 19th or 20th? Yeah, Maybe 21st? Nights, Shoot. Yeah. Um, and so now it's uh, a little bit past full and now it's a waning gibbous moon. And that's great because it's going to be coming up later and later into the evening. And so I think like, um, well, what would it be for uh, if we're looking for dark skies in the southern sky or, you know, like in our viewing area for the evening, it's going to be great during the next couple of weeks. We're going to have a great opportunity to uh, to get to see some dark skies in, uh, in the south, get some good uh, Milky Way viewing in. And uh, that'll kind of come back into play for some of the stuff we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I think that that's going to be cool. So I think. What is it uh, by the next night or what? Did we, well, today is like the 20, 24th. So by the 25th or 26th, we're going to be coming into a place where the moon will be coming up after midnight, maybe toward 1 a.m., 2 a.m. And that'll make it uh, much easier to get some observations in with dark skies between uh, 9 o'clock and midnight. Yeah, that'll be great. It's been a little bit harder these, uh, these last couple of weeks that's been brighter. Yeah, well, that's like what we noticed. Remember like way back when we went to the Alvord Desert and we were out there to do, you know, a lot of observations, but there is just a section like, you know, a two week period of the month that it is difficult to get deep sky observations in because the moon is so bright or it occupies so much of the, of the sky. Yeah. It's way bright. So, um, so there, there's a few good things about that though. And, and part of that is that, uh, this week we're coming into the Delta Aquarian meteor shower and you were looking this one up too, right? Yeah. Uh, the media shower that's coming up. And I guess it's going to be, it's, so here's the thing. And like, you know, this is that the Perseid media shower is going to be coming up uh, around August 11th, 10th, 12th. Yeah. We're going to be getting into weeks. that period. Yeah. Which is going to be cool. And uh, I'm really excited to go look at that media shower. And that's really the star of the summer. Like you've seen before, you know, that's the one that's the most fun to get out. And, uh, and yeah, go, they're the most viewing. Yeah, I think. yeah. I think there's what one a minute. A lot of it depends on the time of year, and often it's never been one a minute when I've been out making observations of it. But when it peaks, it really is a, a pretty impressive meteor shower for for us in the northern hemisphere for this time of year. Um, but I assume that the Delta Aquarian meteor shower is going to uh, see more of the the meteors come out of the constellation Aquarius. That's normally how they're identified for meteor showers. Is that uh, like the the Delta Aquarian meteor shower means that it's going to be coming out? The meteors are going to be coming from the direction of Aquarius in the evening sky. Right. And the same for like the Perseid meteor shower, we're going to be looking at at uh, at meteors coming out of the constellation of Perseus in yeah, the evening sky. Cool. So that's kind of the idea behind it. But I guess uh, what they were saying is about fifteen an hour is yeah. what they're projecting. That doesn't seem like uh, too strong of a peak, but it's enough to, you know, to go out and get a, or, you know, get an option to go see a few. And it's kind of fun to see. I remember a handful of good ones coming out during, uh, during this time of year though. It's a good ramp up as it comes into, uh, uh, the Perseids in just a couple of weeks. So you get a lot of meteor shower activity over the next little bit. Yeah. That'll be pretty cool to check out. What day, what day does that start? I think it's like the, the 24th, 25th or so. If I understand right, so it's probably like uh, like kind of the middle of this next week. This is sort of a longer one, and it's a slower burn, right? Like what we're talking about is that the peak period for uh, for the meteor shower isn't going to be as strong. Like we're only going to get fifteen to to maybe maybe twenty, um, you know, meteors per hour that we're going to uh, get a good observation of. Whereas like with the Perseids, we're getting one a minute, and so that peak is way more noticeable. Um, so if I understood right, it's going to be like a couple days, you know, it's a, or it's a wider span of a period that we're going to have some more meteor activity right. in the evening sky out of that, which would be cool. I think it's most of this week, which would uh, be kind of fun to get to go out. And uh, if you're lucky, you'll catch a couple, a couple of meteors, a little shooting stars going by. 
yeah, we should go uh, just outside of the city a little bit this next week and see. I'd really see like if we to can get some viewings. Yeah, you and I should push a lot this week to get further out of the city lights and do yeah, some cool definitely. observations, do some cool night astronomy photos. Oh, I have a couple ideas that I want to try out with you too. That'd be cool. We'll probably get some fun stuff. I want to try that that other camera with the lens that's the that really wide angle lens. We can do a little bit of what we were talking about in that astrophotography episode where we have a really wide angle lens that we're able to shoot. Uh, so we get longer exposures of our of the evening sky above us so we can get kind of the more light, the brighter sky. It'll be cool. I think we can check out some cool stuff in the in the Milky Way by using that method. Yeah, that'd be really fun. I want to break that stuff out. Yeah, I think it'd be cool. Um, yeah, we should try and do that this next week, and especially because it's July for us. You know, it's coming up to the end of July, and uh, it's strange that we're kind of now on the downhill side of the season. We're going to start sloping into more toward fall, and you really yeah. in just a few weeks by like, I mean, I know it's about a month from now, but it really seems to wrap up pretty quick. It does. And as fast as it's been a month ago from today, that seems like it just happened a minute ago, uh, the end of the end of June, you know. And so it'll be a couple of weeks into August and we'll start feeling that fall feeling up here. The days are going to get a lot shorter. Even in like a week and a half, we're going to notice how much darker it is uh, where we're at when the, or how much earlier it is that the sun goes down. It'll be strange, but, but it, it'll be um, dark by nine o'clock again. It's yeah. Sort of pretty strong, pretty well time. into twilight. Yeah. So we're going to see that kind of really rapidly drop off as uh, the daylight hours start to, to get, dimmer and dimmer and dimmer um as we get i think in like september the time of sunset is about 7 15 or so or you know that's the time it starts getting dark and that's how fast we see things change as we get closer and closer to the equinox yeah i was gonna say i think that um cassiopeia is um starting to come into view which is a fall yeah uh, constellation a lot more into view um yeah, I was looking at it the other day, and, and, and it's definitely on the rise. We're going to start seeing, um, yeah, Cassiopeia and Perseus come up, and uh, Andromeda. We're going to see the rise of Andromeda come up, and then uh, we're going to see Capella. That'll be really cool. So that's, that's always like the onset of fall, and that's those things that you start seeing in the, uh, in the late evening at the beginning of, or end of August, beginning of September. You start seeing those changes in the stars, and a lot of the summer constellations, like what we talked about last week with the summer triangle, and Scorpio and all of that getting much further over into the West. And then as late night comes on, like after 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, you're going to see most of those constellations far enough over that they're really pretty close to the Western horizon. And uh, they're just past our view all of a sudden, which will be strange to kind of see how, how quickly the, the, the stars above us kind of seem to change as we drop from season to season. But it'll be fun. I'm glad that, uh, you know, there's some new stars on the rise. We should do an episode about Cassiopeia and Andromeda and all the section of stuff that you can see over there. That's really fun with binoculars too. Like what we talked about before, it's still in that, that belt of the Milky Way. And so there's all that really dense clusters and you know just observable material out there in that area. It'll be fun to check out. Yeah, it'll be really cool as it starts coming more and more into view. I think so too, yeah. So the other thing that's going on this week and this is something, well, we talked about it before in a past episode back in January, um, was the, uh, the occultations. Do you remember this? Yeah, I do. And it's when something is occulted. <laughs> well, actually, I think you guys, everybody can check it out with, uh, I think it was like episode four, the occultation of Aldebaran, which was uh, an episode that we recorded back uh, in early January of this year. So that probably talks about it a lot, but um, Aldebaran is, is a special star because it's right on that plane of uh, of the ecliptic or, or where the moon is going to pass. Now, there's a few other things that we've learned about the draconic cycle and how the moon kind of shifts six degrees above and below the ecliptic and that there's these nodes where it's right on the money. But, um, but what that means is that the moon kind of floats up and down. So that's why we don't see an occultation of Aldebaran every month. But every once in a while, it seems like every six months or every, I don't know, every once in a while in its cycle, we do get uh, the moon covering... Aldebaran in totality, which is pretty cool. It does this with a few other stars uh, in the sky, and, and it does this with a few other things, but it seems like Aldebaran is one of the, the most common or reoccurring stars that it, it seems to occult. And uh, so we have an occultation coming up on July 29th, which is going to be pretty interesting to see, but it'll probably be more complicated. It's going to be an observation that you would make right before dawn in the morning sky, because it's a winter constellation, right? It's in Taurus. 
Right. And uh, and so since it's a winter constellation, it's going to now just be past the sun after it's been in the sun for since Taurus is a, a, a zodiac sign and a constellation that's on the ecliptic. It's now past the sun. It's in the morning sky. And that's where we're going to see um, Aldebaran shining bright up in the morning sky and then now the moon covering it over for us in the northern hemisphere. So it'll be kind of interesting to check out if you do get a chance to. I looked at the occultation uh, that was back in January. I think there might have been another one since then, but um, but I remember looking at it. And it's it's interesting. It's just what you notice is that there's a star not there, and then there's a moon there. So <laughs> so there's not more to see. It actually just ends up being less to see. But, and this is interesting, and I had not heard of this before, there is more to see if you're in the right part of the planet. Now, what what it's called is a grazing occultation. And that's where, and what, so before I get ahead of, before I get ahead of myself, what it is, is down in, I think, El Paso, Texas, there's this line for the, similar to an eclipse, you know what I'm talking about, where there's different sections of the world where you get to observe the eclipse. Yeah. Yeah. So similarly to this, when we're dealing with an occultation, there's going to be this place on the planet where it's going to be outside of the moon's uh the moon's radius or the moon's diameter so we would just see both objects still there would not be an occultation and then from one perspective one point of view up in here in the northern hemisphere the moon would be occulting aldebaran so there's this one spot though where it's going to graze and you're going to see the the star aldebaran just on the surface of the moon and it's going to pop in and out of uh, a view right on that line. So I think it's like part of El Paso and uh, sort of a diagonal line up that sort of cuts and curves over the south. And so it seems like it's kind of through part of Texas and maybe Louisiana and uh, and Arkansas or a few, a few sections of area like that. There might be a line that you could see. What I looked up was the International Occultation Timing Association. You can go to occultations.org forward slash Alderbaran. And, uh, and there you can see a lot of information about, um, about the July 29th uh, occultation and the line that uh, this graze is going to be happening. But it looks like it'd be kind of cool since it's happening in the morning. What you'd see if, if you're looking at it with binoculars or over time, and I saw a couple of videos that were like time lapses of this, uh, this occurrence, but you see the, the mountains of the moon out way in the distance cover up as the, as the moon passes over Aldebaran, you see really in a refined amount of detail, you're able to see the mountains of the moon occult right on the edge of, of the moon that we can see the disc that we're able to view from Earth. We're able to see the moon kind of cover up the star. And then as it drops out past that mountain, we're able to see the star again from our position of Earth. And uh, so you see the star basically from our view pop in to light. You, know, you can see the star and the moon, and then you see the star disappear behind the moon, and then once again you see the star appear again, and then disappear behind the moon right on that edge before the moon passes over it and uh, the occultation is over. So it's kind of an interesting thing that you can probably make out. And since it's uh, July 29th, we're probably going to have good viewing weather in the morning um, or like you know pre-dawn light, which will be a good opportunity for us to see like in, in the winter time. I remember it was difficult because there's a strong chance that, it, you know, it was just going to be too cloudy or too cold or too rainy because of weather to right. uh, get a chance to make any observations of it for real. So I don't know. It'd be cool. I think we should try, if we can, wake up extra early. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Go see the star is not there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look at that. Look I at can't that. see Aldebaran. The uh, grazing occ occultation sounds really cool, though. It does, It yeah. sounds like it'd be more interesting it of is an kind observation of an, if you're able to do it. Yeah, it seems like it's kind of unique, and it's really not in the same place a lot of the time. Like, the line that that grazing occultation is going to occur seems like it shifts around, similar to how an eclipse would shift around on the surface of the planet. There's probably a cycle to it, or, like, you know, some kind of period of repetition that it does. Like, when we talked about the metonic cycle and how the, uh, the growth of an eclipse happens over time i think it's really interesting how that works but i think it'd be similar in this way of how these occultations of uh, aldebaran occur over time and, and where that grazing line is yeah but that'd be interesting it seems cool though it, it seems, seems cool. cool um so i don't know it's a small thing but it's one of those those little sky watching events that uh would be kind of fun to see i always like seeing uh, stuff like that i think i remember shoot what was the other one i remember there was a time when the moon 
occulted Mars in the sky. I think it was back in 2007. I remember watching it from uh, the back door of uh, the place I was living at in Corvallis. But yeah, there's this time when uh, yeah the moon, it was like a crescent moon in the evening sky. And this is when Mars was really dim um, on, what, during a period that the, the, that the planet Mars was on the far side of us in its orbit. Like right now it's at its close edge. And so that's why it's really right. big and bright. This is at a period when it's pretty small and, and really uh, just as apparent to us as it would be uh, just as a, as a little star in the evening sky. Um, so it wasn't super apparent, but you could, you could tell, you know, you could tell it was a planet, but, um, but yeah, there's the, the crescent moon that kind of passed over it for a few hours. And I remember it was April, so it was partly cloudy and you could, I got to see it for like a little bit and then it was too cloudy and then I couldn't see it anymore. And then you could see it again for a little while. So it kind of went back and forth, but it's cool to see. It's really fun when you get it there. Is, yeah. And this one would be kind of cool too, because so what's different about this occultation of Aldebaran is that the moon is going to be much closer to a crescent moon. And so I think that makes it more observable for us. Uh, the tricky thing is that it's going to be near sunrise. It's going to be getting closer to that point where uh, we're getting into twilight and then dawn. And that's going to make it a little bit more difficult just because you're not going to be able to see as many um, fine details in, this, in the night sky. You're not going right. to see. Yeah. It's and that was, a, that was a tricky thing, right? Is that Aldebaran is one of the brightest things in that section of the sky. Yes, there's Orion and there's a few of the other stars that are nearby, but in that formation at least that's what you notice first you know is, right. is Aldebaran and so you, when that's gone and the moon is right there it's bright enough that it really blows out the rest of the constellation the Taurus around it um, so sometimes you're just like well I just see the moon I didn't even really notice that there was a star I couldn't see <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know so it feels like that sometimes um, but it would be a cool a cool opportunity to see it because I remember back in January when we were looking at it It was really a, I think it was a waxing gibbous moon that we were looking at uh, during the occultation and so that's where uh, It was just really almost full It's probably like three or four days from the position of full in the sky And that made it so much brighter in the evening sky that it was difficult to see really anything else in the evening sky around it at all And so that's where it was, you know, a lot more difficult and that's why this time given that it's a crescent, it'd probably be darker out for a while and you could see more things around it and uh, probably get some observations of like the Perseids next to it and the rest of that V that's there that creates the head of Taurus. So there's probably some more stuff that you could kind of poke around and get a view of. Yeah. It'd be cool. Um, yeah, so uh, it was really cool. Um, the other day, my friend Dave and I, we went out and we grabbed the telescope and uh, we did some truck trip stuff. We were driving around in the mountains for a little while, but when it got dark out, we, uh, we tried to set everything up so that we could uh, get a couple observations in with the telescope out there. And we still have the planets up. We, there's, you know, like we were talking about last week, there was uh, Venus in the evening sky and Mercury for a while, but those are real close to the horizon. And so we waited a while so that it was really pretty dark out. And we were uh, looking out to the west and really now it's it's amazing to see like just a few months ago how we were looking at Jupiter being uh, in opposition to us back in April, rising right as the sun was setting. And then now as we're getting deep into the year, we see Jupiter far out to the west in the evening and then it sets pretty quickly, uh, you know, after that. But I think it's still in Leo and I think Leo is going to be in the sun during the month of August. So we probably only have a few more weeks of good observations of uh, of Jupiter before it gets too deep into the to the western sky um you know around sunset but it was fun we uh we pulled out the telescope and set it up uh, sighted it into jupiter and i think we were able to we spotted two moons definitely probably callisto and ganymede but i don't really ever know if that's a if that's a fair statement to make you know you're never sure it's like, yeah like oh like, could that be it or could that not be uh so i think there was well there was just too much light where we were at to to make out any finer details maybe it was the telescope itself too but we could definitely make out um, two of them. And I think what we were figuring is that uh, at least one of them was like behind Jupiter during that time, which happens like what we noticed when we were looking at the, the evening sky too, or looking at, uh, at Jupiter specifically is that, uh, you know, every part of the cycle of the moon's rotating around Jupiter is that every once in a while they get behind Jupiter. So right. you're not able to see him for a bit of time. So it was cool. It was cool sighting that in. And then, um, there's uh, there's Mars over in Libra. It's moving quickly now in prograde back into uh, into the, the constellation of Scorpio. Um, we checked that out a little bit. It's a red dot. It's really cool. It's I think most fun just viewing with the naked eye. 
and yeah. it's getting a lot dimmer now. If you notice, um, and we should we should go out tonight and look at this. But uh, if you make uh, like observation, or if you kind of think about, let's say those pictures that we took, maybe almost two months ago now, at the end of May, we could see the positions of of Saturn, Mars, and the constellation Scorpio, and where they are. And what we were looking at is Mars being much higher uh, above above the southern horizon, it would be much higher up and higher than Saturn right. in the constellation of Scorpio. But what we noticed is that as it went into retrograde and dropped back into Libra, it got lower in the sky. And now as it's coming back into Scorpio, it's going to be at a lower position. It's actually going to be underneath Saturn as it crosses through. Whereas before it would have been above Saturn, it's right. going to be below Saturn now as it drops through now that it's back into prograde motion and, uh, and moving or transiting back in through... Uh, through the constellation of Scorpio. So it'll be cool. It'll be cool to see that's going to be happening in just a couple of weeks. I think um, during the period of the Perseid meteor showers that we're talking about and like that second week of August, we're going to start seeing Mars really close back in toward uh, Antares and in that section of the sky there in the, in the heart of Scorpio. So it'll be kind of cool to get to poke around and check out. But uh, we sighted in Saturn after that. And that was really, <laughs> Saturn's been really tough to sight in a few of these times, uh, especially with the equipment that we've got. But uh, we were able to pull in Saturn in the night sky and uh, get some observations of that. And that was really cool because you, you can really make out those rings really well. Do you remember uh, checking out Saturn and how well you can see those rings at this this time of year? Just yeah, it's great. Its it has a like good little tilt to it and you can really see them going around. Yeah, yeah, you really can. And you can see the separation. Um, there's like a gap in the ring. You yeah, know, there's a main ring and there's a gap in it. It's really cool that you can make out those kind of details with it. I think that's it was pretty fun. I was looking at a couple pictures that they had on uh, on Sky and Telescope that uh, some amateur astronomers made back in June. I think on June third when it was in a, when Saturn was at opposition to the Earth, and uh, those were really cool. But it it really seems like you have this perspective where you're kind of looking up at the south pole of Saturn up to the rings um, that are kind of up. That's what it right. seems like it looks like. I, I might have that twisted a little bit, but it seems like, yeah, we're kind of looking up at the bottom of it right now during its, uh, its rotation around the sun, which is pretty cool. And that's, that's what gives us that, uh, that great viewing angle of the rings that we're able to see. Uh, and that's kind of fun. So it's, it's really cool. I did, well, I, we weren't able to spot any of the moons around Saturn. And I'm sure that's because like the telescope is just, uh, it's like a three and a half inch refractor, yeah, reflector, it's... reflector telescope. And that's where we need something that's bigger. Right. I want yeah, to see Titan it. and uh, Pythes. Oh, there's a handful of cool moons around Saturn that we should definitely get a chance to look at. I think it's been too long. We got to work on getting a cool telescope. Yeah, we need to get an upgrade figured out. Got to get upgrades figured out. Um, we were looking at the galactic center, too. After we looked at Saturn, it's it's right over from that. So looking at uh, like Scorpio, we have that really dense area of the sky down there where you see uh, like Scorpio and then the tail of Scorpio. And then there's that gap in between the tail of Scorpio and then the teapot shape. That's that asterism in Sagittarius. And that's, that's a fun one to look at. But in that area of the sky, especially if you have dark skies, there's so much dense Milky Way, I don't know, features right behind Sagittarius in that area. And it's really cool to, to look at. Have you been out in dark enough skies to get to see some of that? Uh, yeah, but not, not really. Yeah, or like enough, enough. We but. should go out even real soon. We should go out probably during this period of uh, of like a new moon. We should go out to a really dark area so that we can try and get some good some good views of the that area of the sky. But Sagittarius is really cool. There's a section, and it's strange. You you really can't see it in an area where there's a lot of light pollution. Like tonight in the city here, even at a dark night as it is, or just outside of town, it would be a difficult feature to try and make out. But there, there's this kind of glowing spot that's right out the front tip of, of the teapot. If you were to imagine the spout of the teapot and that asterism, but you go just out from that and down slightly, there's sort of a, a glowing section that's a bit brighter. Uh, and it's just the Milky Way. It's just a bright section of the Milky Way there. Uh, but it's a bit brighter and you can kind of make it out. It's difficult if you look directly at it. We talked about right. this before. Do you remember the side vision? Yeah, you've explained this to me before. Yeah, it's really tricky. Our eyes are, are peculiar. And we'll get back to that feature in a second. But to spot this feature, you almost have to use your side vision. And it's this 
thing that uh, sky watchers have used for a long time it's it has to do with the anatomy of the eyeball when we're looking at the eyeball <laughs> and then the retina um, i guess what you have is cone cells and rod cells and your cone cells are more densely packed and located right at the center of your eye right in that focus point like where, where you look at and those are really good at identifying the separation of different colors and uh, and different tones and, and color like that but they're not as good at recognizing contrast or separations in brightness and darkness. And that's where your rod cells come into play. And those are more populated on the uh, periphery of your vision. And so those are really good at picking up lights and darks. And that's why when you look directly at something that's a very dim object, it's almost difficult to see one of these dim stars that you thought you could see a second ago in your peripheral vision. And what they notice is by using your side vision, by looking a little bit off from your dead center focus that your eyes would naturally draw themselves to. You focus yourself just a little bit to the side of that. And then you try and use, it's difficult almost to look at something, but then focus at a different point in your peripheral vision. But you can get good at it after a while. And it's, it's an easy thing to do. But you look just a little bit to the side of it. And then you'll notice that those dim objects, those fifth magnitude stars, or those, those kind of more delicate features in the evening sky that uh, seem like they're really dim, you're able to make those out a little bit better because uh, just because you're using your side vision and there's more sensitive cells to uh, bright and dark. But it's cool. So when you look out to Sagittarius, you can see this uh, kind of glowing patch there. And that's uh, really close to the galactic center of the Milky Way, which is pretty cool. That feature has a name to it. I should, I should try and look it up sometime. Um, but uh, it's really cool because that section of uh, the Milky Way there would be the center of our galaxy is what we figured out. And it's really weird to try and um, perceive that. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Trying to perceive how the, the geometry of our galaxy is set up in the way that we look out into the evening sky. It's very difficult to figure out or to understand. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it is pretty complicated. But when we do look up, what we're able to see is that uh, we have all this section of the Milky Way above us where we have these really bright stars. You know, we have like what we talked about last week, the summer triangle where we have Altair, we have Vega, we have Deneb, that really, that other really bright star that's super far away. And all of this, all of that section, even out into Cassiopeia and Capella and further on from that, and what we see in the winter constellations of uh, Orion and then further down into Canopus, all this section of uh, really bright uh, first magnitude stars that we see, they're all part of the galactic disk that we would look out to. Like if you were to imagine that uh, that middle school science picture that you would see of a spiral galaxy, one of those distance galaxies, sure. which the one we look at, I think, is either a facsimile or it's a photograph that Hubble took of another spiral galaxy that would be similar in size, similar <laughs> in shape. But we're not able to photograph our own galaxy, of right. course, because we're not able to get out of it. <laughs> it's too big. I think it's 100,000 light years across. And so our sun is nestled into one of those spirals about two thirds of the way out from the center as it is. And so when we look out into the Milky Way above us, we're looking into our spiral arm of the galaxy, which is a peculiar thing to try That's and uh, perceive. Yeah. That. Yeah. Right. And then we're also looking more distant into that uh, out further and further and further into other sections of the galaxy. But when we look into that milky substance that we see, that's distant stars that are super far away, maybe hundreds of thousands of light years or, or well, maybe not, not hundreds of thousands, less than 100,000, but up to 10,000 maybe. I don't know what they'd be, but there's deep sky objects that are in that area um, that you look out into. And then a lot of other things that are closer too, like uh, like Vega we were talking about is 27 light years away. Things that are more in our local group, close to us in, uh, in our neighborhood where our star is, uh, which is pretty interesting how that, how that works. But then as we look further south at this time of year, um, what we're going to see is uh, as we get into Sagittarius, there's a, a really dense cluster of, uh, of Milky Way in that area. You know how it looks like the Milky Way? It doesn't right. really quite look like stars themselves individually, but it looks murky almost, or it looks hazy yeah. as it is. And uh, so as we get closer and closer to Sagittarius, that's where that galactic center is, uh, where the, the bigger section is. And I think that's because we found uh, like an X-ray source over there when we started doing uh, things with radio telescopes. What we noticed is that when we pointed our telescope, our, our radio in that direction, we would get a signal, kind of a, a scratchy, hissy signal. And that was from the galactic center. We'd pick up this tone from it, this RF signal that would come out from, I think, probably 
whatever x-ray source it is. I don't know if they say it's a black hole there or if it's just a lot of energy. I'm not quite sure. I think they say it's a black hole near that, uh, that center cluster of our galaxy um, is, uh, is different, different stars that have collapsed into each other to make a, a larger black hole at the center. But that's just, a, I, who knows? We haven't been there. But that is the, uh, the galactic center over there. And it's pretty cool to, to kind of perceive, if you can, when you're trying to think about uh, where our place is in the galaxy. It's, it's kind of fun. It's very interesting. It's cool. And then what you'll notice really particularly, and especially this time of year, is a great time to start perceiving this, uh, is that thinking of that section of the Milky Way that we look at has really all of the dense, bright, first magnitude stars that we have. And then there's a handful that are separated or, or spread out from that, uh, that point of the disk. But what you notice is that further away from that disk that we look at that is the Milky Way, the thinner and thinner the density of the stars that we look out and see in the, the evening sky are. So as we, as, um, well, let's see, as like Lyra and Cygnus and Aquila get higher and higher in the sky, those uh, constellations that have Vega, Altair, and Deneb in them, and that center mass of the Milky Way, as that gets higher and higher, what we notice on the eastern horizon is Pegasus starts to rise up. Uh, Pegasus, the great square. It's known as that because there's a really big area of the sky where there's, you know, a, a square made up of the four second magnitude stars that make up uh, that big box of Pegasus. But in the center of that, there's really almost no bright stars. There's no other material there. And it starts to get, what I'm saying is, and what you start noticing is that that part of the sky gets much and much less dense in stars. Like after Sagittarius, as Capricorn starts rising and as Aquarius starts rising, what we notice is that there's really almost no first magnitude or second magnitude stars in that region until we get to um, Thamelo, which starts to rise probably in the beginning of September. If you stay up late enough, um, you'll probably start seeing Thamelo come up. And that's the brightest star in the southern sky for the fall sky. And it's really strange how that is, but you just see a big gap. Since there's so much activity right now in our fall sky, we have the galactic center, we have Sagittarius, Scorpio, the two planets is really active and bright. And then in a few months, we'll just notice that whole section of the sky is really almost vacant. And that's because we're looking away from the galactic center. We're looking away from that, that disk, that dense disk of the Milky Way that has the uh, population of all of the bright main sequence first magnitude stars that we're able to see. And then later in the year, we start seeing um, the other end of the Milky Way start coming up as we see more of Cassiopeia and more of the Pleiades and Aldebaran and Orion and everything that kind of carries south from that, including, you know, Procyon and Sirius and Canopus down into the Southern Hemisphere. That's all still on a line of the Milky Way where we have uh, a lot of that activity of those bright stars. But it's cool. It's really strange to kind of see how the, how everything kind of spins around us throughout the year as we yeah. kind of move around the sun. So it'll be fun. It'll be cool to, to get to check out. But, uh, but yeah, you guys should try and um, make out some observations of that. Our listeners, I mean, <laughs> all, all 12 of them uh, should, uh, should take a second to, to kind of think about where the galactic center is over in Sagittarius and, and how different the star, how different space looks just a few degrees past that as it gets dimmer or thinner and thinner in its density of stars in the evening sky. It'd be kind of cool. Yeah, it's really a neat spot to be looking at it. I thought so too, yeah. It's a, it's a great time of year. It's a, it's a really fun area to look in the sky. Um, for us in this area so it'd be cool but uh i i was gonna say and you you should talk about this a lot but um we had a, another listener email come in i want to say thanks a bunch to jason to uh for getting a hold of us again that was really cool he got a hold of us one time before but it's really fun to hear that uh that someone's been listening to it uh, at least a couple more times since uh since i don't know whenever it was back in march or february that he got a hold of us before but uh, it was great he sent us an email um had a handful of photographs of the moon that he took did you get to see those? Yeah, I did. It was really cool. I think he sent us uh, four photos over that he took of the moon with his telescope and yeah. camera. Really cool, yeah. Got some mounts to set it up. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing that we got to figure out is the uh, the mounts for our camera to attach <laughs> our camera sensor to the telescope. And the telescope. And it's telescope. That we, that oh, we yeah. Should, oh, that we, we should be attaching oh, we our need all that to. stuff. <laughs> But yeah, that was super cool. Thank you so much, Jason, for sending those photos over to us. And uh, I think he was mentioning that uh, on the, the chance he gets for another outing, he's going to try to do some planetary photos, which would be super cool. I'd love yeah. to see those if he, if he get it. That'd out. be so cool. I want to see some Saturn or some Jupiter. It'd be pretty cool. 
I think yeah, you... definitely, definitely good inspiration for us to to get our uh, stuff in shape, I get know. a new telescope. I've been looking at those pieces like it, it's just like an attachment that would go onto the eyepiece, and then right. there's there's like a just a lens mount on the other end of that, so you, we can take our camera, like the D3 or something, we could take that and just snap it onto that, and then effectively the lens to the camera is the telescope. Right. I don't understand really, and I'm sure there's lots of tutorials out there. I don't understand that you sight the telescope in at that point. Like now that the uh, camera's hooked up to it and you have to like move it, wiggle it around the whole time. So I'm sure there's a way to do it. You could probably just techniques. do it through the eyepiece in a frustrated manner. <laughs> it's like, oh shoot, what do I do? Um, but there's probably a cool way to do it. I think it'd be fun to to try out. We should try and get a piece. I think I've seen cheap versions of that around for a lot of money, but less money. You know? Yeah. <laughs> It's like probably uh, 200 bucks or something. We should check it out. I think so too. I think it'd be really cool. I've also seen these other pieces too. I don't think this would be the right choice for us, but I've seen these other pieces where uh, it just it's an astrophotography camera. It's like special built for that purpose. And so instead of oh, sure. what we have, like a camera, camera, like a DSLR, what this is is basically a, it's a digital sensor. It's like a, you know, like a full frame sensor or something like that that's kind of specially encased in this block and that's the the telescope camera and so it's really just made to fit onto a telescope that's what its whole purpose is those are like those are like 600 to a thousand dollars it's probably more than a thousand dollars you could probably get some great features out of that i bet that there's probably some better quality options that you have with that but i'm not sure though i i'm not completely convinced that it would be the best thing for it or not but we should look into it a little bit i just see those listed on the side as uh, little peripheral items for your telescope sure. if you're into uh into astrophotography but yeah it looks like this little encased metal box that uh, just kind of clamps on and that's your image sensor for that's your telescope cool. that kind of collects light yeah if you if you're not really into photography but you want to do astrophotography that's probably a good option it, no it really is i'm sure that 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 special built tool is is better for for that purpose you know what i mean like it yeah. probably has features and and options for for doing astrophotography that would be better than uh, than just like a regular nikon or canon dslr Sure. added onto the top of the telescope so and this probably has to do with some of the optical quality that or the the mounting options that you have to get to the telescope i'm not sure what the weakest link in that chain would be but i bet if you have a cool camera for astrophotography it would be better prepared to do uh you know cool planetary yeah. photographs and stuff it might be better at low light too that's what i wonder a lot about you know it's like how do you, how do you get like great resolution or more light into the camera if everything's so dark are so dim like how do you how do you do it without doing like a long exposure on your camera right if you're taking pictures of planets or something with the moon you could probably get away with it pretty well which i really liked about those photos we saw from jason was that you know it's bright enough that you can kind of expose for it in your camera but i wonder if you could do it as easily if you're taking photographs of jupiter and its moons you know can you still do a 30th of a second exposure or a 10th of a second exposure whatever it would be i wonder about that too i think it's a little bit different with telescopes because or when you're doing photos with a telescope because the telescope magnifies what you're looking at but it also brings in a lot more light yeah it does and that's where you get if i understand right you get a huge benefit in your resolution what color and, and what you're really able to see I think so because based on how big the diameter of your your yeah, objective how big lens the is. Of the, yeah and that's what's able to collect more light and i think that's you're right what helps show a lot more light yeah you're probably able to do it easily then i this is something that we should look into a little bit more i only read just a little bit about it but there are sort of different kinds of telescopes that are better for the type of astrophotography that you're trying to do oh, really? like if you're trying to photograph planets specifically yeah. i think you want something that's a longer focal length huh. for your telescope because of the way that it collects light and yeah, shows it to you that it okay. and then if you're trying to do um like like deep space galaxies or like nebulas right. and, and things like that, then that's um, like a fast telescope. Huh. Um, oh, I get that. Yeah. So similar like what we talk about, like a fast lens, like a, right, a yeah. wider aperture. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. And it's a wider one so that it, I guess it does better at capturing those fainter, huh. more soft things. Interesting. So that's something that we should think about a little bit. When yeah, we should. At telescopes and like Jason was recommended, we need to get a better telescope. Yes. We need to get a real telescope. <laughs> We oh, should yeah. set that. We're I think we're trying to set up a Patreon page. I want to get that going. Our goal should be yeah, <laughs> get Billy and Marina a telescope. 
that we could uh, make a bunch of observations. How cool would that be? That'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty yeah, fun. we should uh, we should start looking into the kind of telescope we should grab. Oh yeah, definitely. There are so many options out there. There are a ton. Yeah, we should get something cool that we can kind of grow with for a while. I want to have yeah. something that's good, but kind of small enough that we can pack around and, and make use that's of a lot. That's what I want still too. Yeah, yeah. but I really want to get a you know a front facing objective lens that's that's big enough yeah. to get to get what we'd want, right? Yeah. <laughs> To get some good uh, good observations in, get some good resolution, be able to see some more stuff. I think that'd be fun. Like right now, we can just barely make out those red bands on Jupiter. We, that's right. really all we can yeah. make out. And there's so much more you can see with just a better resolution than a telescope. Definitely. It'd be really fun. And there's all those deep sky objects too. We yeah, should get into that. that would be really cool. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff like these globular clusters where you just see this little patch. And it's like a thousand little stars <laughs> all kind of clumped together. That sort of stuff's really fun too, where you get to... They, hey, well, look at that. I didn't know that was there. Or nebula or other, other features yeah. that are really pretty to see. There's a bunch of fun stuff that, uh, that you can make out in the evening sky. We should get that, that uh, deep sky book. That oh, yeah. Book. yeah. I want to, I do. I deep get sky atlas would be really good that kind of uh, runs down really meticulously everything out to like a 12th magnitude object that's observable in the evening sky in, in every constellation. It's just this really yeah. good in depth chart. To, to find it and identify different features in the night sky. And I think that's something that definitely qualifies for us to try and have. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. And if anybody out there is interested in stuff, I bet that would be a huge, uh, a huge benefit to your, your observations throughout the year is having something like that that you definitely. can go to and reference. Yeah. It's really, it's really useful, especially when you're new to it still and you're, you don't always remember exactly where things are in relation to oh, each yeah. other. It's really nice or it's really cool just having a reference yeah, I totally agree. I think having like a real reference like that is great. When I was a kid, I had just the little constellation book of stuff, yeah. and that was what I used all the time. I was like, hey, what, how does this work? So I think having like a real a real chart that would that would be a big game changer for us. I, so. <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to check it out sooner or later. But I think that's just about everything we have to get into for this episode of the Night Sky Podcast. On behalf of Marina Hansen, I want to say thank you all very much for listening. Please uh, rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast if you want to. Give it a couple things to check out. I think it'd be rad. But uh, yeah, on behalf of Marina Hansen, thanks a lot for listening. My name is Billy Newman, and I hope you guys get to tune in next time for episode 18 of the Night Sky Podcast.